Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. Gentlemen, I'm thrilled to have on today Neil Gordon, who is a communications expert helping people speak better and get their message across more effectively. So this was a little bit of a more, less of an interview and more of a coaching session for me, uh, where we spoke about my general approach, uh, what I think is working well marketing wise in, in the Jewish world, the coaching world, what we could do better. And uh, Neil was very kind to open himself up a little bit and explain his experience uh, with Judaism. And uh, <laughs> there was a lot of takeaways in terms of marketing, in terms of figuring out the the big ideas for the next steps going forward. I felt uh, like my mind was on uh, was racing by the end. So I, I hope you get a lot out of this and, and learn a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, Lift Your Legacy is committed to helping you live a more authentic and meaningful life. That being said, if I could ask you to share this podcast with someone that you think would get value from the message, that would be fantastic. In addition, I wanted to make you aware that along with the podcast, I do offer executive coaching. I help people who are successful and highly motivated, who want to see extreme, or not even so extreme, maybe just a small change that in their life. I want to help them get to the next level. What does that mean specifically? Creating more peace in your relationships with yourself, growing your business, clarifying your career. And even if you need a little bit of help losing some weight or getting more healthy, I do that also. I'm not for everyone, but for those people that are invested in making their life better and taking the next step, I highly recommend you consider me as a coach for you. Now, how do you get in touch? Well, you found the podcast. I wanted to tell you also my email, Jacob, my first name, Jacob at lift your legacy dot live. Feel free, please, to reach out there or on all, any or all of my social media channels. I'd be thrilled to give you a complimentary half an hour conversation to see if we might be a good fit to work together. And now, with no further ado, I ask you to please sit back and enjoy the show. I am thrilled to have today Neil Gordon, who is a communications expert who helps people tell their stories effectively. And uh, in our pre, pre-call pre conversation, uh, Neil not only offered to graciously share his own story, but to help me more effectively tell mine. So I'm, I'm fired up for this uh, hopefully very uh, revealing uh, episode. Thank you so much for joining me, sir. Of course, Jacob. It's great to be here. Okay. So Neil, how did you get to where you are in terms of helping people tell their story more effectively. What's your story, so to speak? Well, it's kind of funny how when I have a background in book publishing, where I was an editor, a low-level editor at Penguin, and I work with New York Times bestselling authors and fiction and nonfiction and the whole thing. And especially because of the other people who were going up the ranks of the, the publishing hierarchy and whatnot, I found that a lot of people were English majors from some pedigree school and they got 750 on their SAT verbal score and, and the whole thing. And what was kind of funny was that my background was quite antithetical to that in that I hated reading growing up. I was actually really good at it. I was in the 99th percentile for reading comprehension in first grade. And then by seventh grade, I was in the 54th percentile. And then the first time I took the SATs in high school, I got a 330 verbal score, which put me in the fifth percentile. And so my, my capacity to understand language, planned content, or what have you, just deteriorated. My brain went to mush. I got my score up a little bit by the time I graduated. So I got into school and I got really good grades the whole time. I had a capacity for school, but it was just, it was without ever reading anything. And so... I went through college, didn't read anything then either, still got a 3.5 GPA and managed to do pretty well with all of that. 
And then I started reading at the very end of college just for pleasure for the first time since I was like eight. And I started getting into it a little bit, but then when I graduated, I moved to New York City and I needed an escape from the subway. I didn't actually do very well in New York City. And I was just kind of overwhelmed by all the stimulation and the, the grime and crowdedness of the subways. So I started reading. This was before smartphones. So thankfully, I couldn't just play whatever Candy Crush or whatever people would do when they, when they wanted to zone out on the subway now. And I read this book called A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving. And I went through this, the, the, the main character who I became very emotionally invested in didn't, didn't have a good life by the end. Like I had a Hollywood, I watched TV and movies growing up and I had this Hollywood sense of how things would turn out in the end. Like everything will work out because that's how it is in the movies kind of thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to happen that way. And what this character's plight demonstrated was how true that is. Even though it was fiction, it was very real to me. And it just led to this, Jacob, honestly, it's just this whole mindset shift, this whole worldview shift that like anything could happen. So therefore we could die in a ditch alone somewhere. It was just like, it was this really existentialist kind of angsty 20 something thing that I went through. And it's kind of cliched and predictable actually, but on the other side of it, I just had, why is it so cliche and predictable? Uh, the angst, what's it all mean? Kind of reality bites, kind of 20 something thing, I guess. Like I always think of reality bites as the, the quintessential 20 something angst kind of thing. And I just feel that like, what am I going to do with my life? And does it ever, what, what is actually the meaning of life and all of that? It's the sort of thing where there's this, this very agnostic kind of thing. Maybe I wasn't the only, like, maybe it wasn't everyone going through that, but I feel like I wasn't the only one. No, totally. It's, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating for me to hear because something that, that hearing you sort of brought up is, you, you, you know, I, the, the, there's a, there's a, a filmmaker who I like a lot named David Ayers, who wrote, um, he, he was, his big breakout role was, tra big breakout script was Training Day. Then he wrote a second movie yes. that I happen to have loved called End of Watch. And what was so fascinating, sorry, spoiler alert, that's from like 2012. So if you haven't seen it by now, it's kind of, you know, it's okay. But yeah. um, what was shocking was the same thing. Was it was a, it was one of those great, you know, partner, you know, cop movies. But at the end, like it just ends dark and you're like, oh my God, like, is never yeah. going to be okay. And it's like, no. And it's interesting because from my perspective, instead of going into that angsty space that you in, and maybe it's because I live in that angsty space, I was more upset at him for not projecting the feel good thing that we want out of Hollywood. So it's just mm -hmm. an interesting that you were introspective about your life as a result. And I was upset because I figured that life is anyway dark. So I might as well go and be entertained by positive things. Just kind of an interesting, uh, uh, yeah, it's off. a funny twist because we have a difference in worldview in terms of where we were at. Our baseline was very different. Right. We exactly. already had that kind of kind of questioning or existential dilemma or whatever it is yeah. around the nature of life. Whereas I was kind of, even though life was tough up until that point in time, it was still puppies and ponytails right. kind of thing yeah. a little yeah. bit. And so yeah, that so that that reading experience dissuaded me. So I actually just rewatched Training Day last week for the first oh, time in years. And the best. And it's, it's dark stuff. I wouldn't say it's probably as dark as, and I haven't seen End of Watch, but I, I imagine that, I can imagine what that tone would be like based on what he did with Training Day. Um, anyway, so the, the, the upshot of all of this, Jacob, is that I didn't just become introspective and try to numb myself with and anesthetize myself to this discovery, I actually became rather curious around the written word after that. And I just read everything by John Irving I could find. And I read all these other big ambitious books and doing a lot of reading on the subways and at home and wherever. And it all came down to me trying to figure out how the written word and content in general could become so meaningful to me. And on the other side of that, I just had marketable skills as an editor. I mean, I'm glossing over a lot, but basically I got hired as an editorial assistant at that point. I was 27. So this guy with the 330 verbal score on the SATs wound up 
working with New York Times bestselling authors a few years later. And so it's just this really random and almost ironic journey toward becoming a con eventually becoming a content and communications expert. Fascinating. And now, and now like who do you help and what do you help them do? Yeah. A lot of my, I mean, as a preference to our conversation. Yeah, of course. Basically, I went through a long phase of primarily just helping ghostwrite books and collaborate on books, nonfiction books specifically for a number of years. But I had a pretty significant shift when I realized from a marketing standpoint, I could potentially try to market myself to people writing books and all of that. But when I learned a lot about marketing a couple of years ago, the big aha moment was around the value of showing up for public speakers in that the process I had figured out and my signature process, which had been already in the works with books was not only just as applicable for public speaking and crafting a signature talk, the kind of keynote you might get paid five or 10 or $25,000 for that sort of thing. It was just as applicable, but it was also a more immediate need in that you're going to be up in front of 700 people at a conference you really want to show up. And there's an interesting thing that seems to happen with existing public speakers or would-be public speakers that is less of an issue with, right, with being an author of a nonfiction book, and that's imposter syndrome. And that's the sense of like, what am I doing up here? Who am I to be up here talking to all these people? And so what I, what I know about your work, Jacob, and I, I feel like there's going to be, I, I, you're, you're writing this conversation and I, I want to respond, but when learning more about your work and all that, I was like, oh, I, I very much see how this could line up potentially. And I'm so this. excited. Okay, let's, let's, let's jump into it. Tell me a little bit. I mean, and just, just for our, our listeners to know in our, in our pre-show conversation, I shared a little bit with, with Neil about how I'm extremely passionate about I guess you could say human greatness, human optimization, specifically through the lens of leadership and entrepreneurship, and then specifically through the lens of how religion, namely Judaism, as I am a rabbi, can be changed, I guess, can sort of change the conversation to helping people live their optimal lives, but through the lens of a, a very ancient, perhaps one of the most ancient systems. And... Um, but one of the challenges that besides that imposter syndrome, which, which as someone that does not fit in, at least by look to the traditional Orthodox community, nor do I work within the traditional Orthodox community, mm -hmm. um, besides the imposter syndrome, also just how do, you, how do you market the message so that it could bring the most value to the most people? So that was sort of what I threw out on my plate as I vomited all the things I like to do, sent you my email and some of my books, and, uh, and, now, and now I'm excited for the next step. Of course, all right, so this is, this is very fertile ground, Jacob. I'm very excited that we're gonna to get to talk about this today because you very much embody what I imagine a lot of your listeners struggle with as well in that in, in the conversation around having this legacy and having an impact in the way that we very much want what you and many others deal with is this struggle to know in your heart of hearts and when you actually are in front of somebody and talking with them, how much value is there in the underlying concepts and whatnot, but it's hard to fit into a certain box. It's hard to check off the boxes that you, you have all the things like when thinking about like, I was raised in a, not an Orthodox household, Jewish household, but a conservative one. So we, we kept kosher and we, went to a conservative synagogue and, and just so we're clear, not politically conservative, but conservative in the structure and the context of Judaism and whatnot. Movement, conservative movement. Yes, of course. Right, right. And so because you're struggling in that way, what you have is sort of like a, a packaging problem. It's a marketing and packaging problem as opposed to the, the essence of your work. And so what we're ultimately looking at here in the conversation around your attracting people and building the movement that you're, you're, you're wanting to build to be the face of the movement that you want to become is persuasion. This ultimately becomes a matter of persuading others of not only the viability of an idea, but the value it has for them 
to, bro- to, 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 to bring them in, to broaden their perspective around what's possible. Okay. And so what I find that a lot of speakers and authors and other people who are aspiring, who are experts in something and are inspiring to become the face of a movement, what they're all doing is providing as much information as they can. That what people think persuades others is as much content as possible. But we're in the information age and we have all of the information that we could ever want is in like these little devices in our pockets and stuff, right? We, we, we have all the information we need. What your job, Jacob, and what the job of others like you is, is to not provide more knowledge, but rather to convince others that change is possible. That when someone shows up at one of these conferences, the 700 people in that conference or whatever, they don't show up for information, even though they think, oh, I just want to get some tips or some, 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 maybe a process I could go through or what have you. What they really want is change. I've gone, every conference I've gone to, it's because I aspire to something greater in some aspect of my life. And that conference is going to somehow help me to do so. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to wear a couple of hats right now, if that's okay with you. Of course. Uh, So in my hat as someone, and one of the areas that I am particularly passionate about, both because I love the, um, I love the, obviously the work of inspiring other people. And also because I spent most of my professional career in the nonprofit space is helping other rabbis and content providers do a better job as well. And so I wanted to specify just what I'm hearing from so far, what I've gotten from the conversation so far is I think in a lot of, and chime in with me on this as a, as a, uh, a, a former attendant, or I'm, I'm not sure where, where your attendance yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as someone that grew up in a Jewish world, I think that the majority of the Jewish system today sort of still rel- relies on guilt and obligation as a reason to enroll the people that come in. Meaning it's like, you know, come on the Holocaust, come on your grandmother, come on, you have to do this. You're Jewish, you should do this. Right. And, and, and the whole movement as a whole has moved, doesn't even articulate in any way, this concept of value. What, what should I do? And I think that, and this is something else that, that I've developed both myself and with, with, uh, with colleagues that I speak to this with is, you know, if you take out the fear out of religion and the, and the, the negativity, you know, you, you have to still be able to articulate, okay, so like, why should I do this if I'm no longer worried about death, hell, you know, my grandmother's, you know, being angry at me and whatever, whatever it might be. So you're saying that the shift has to be focusing on what value, practically speaking, am I providing the person that I'm speaking to? That's, that's point number one. Mm-hmm. And then point number, go ahead, would you please feel free to add. Yeah, I mean, I'll very much have a response for you as to how we can look at this more systematically and whatnot. I just want to make sure I have a full overview of the various perspectives from which you want us to right well i i I want them all so that the the other the other perspective is you know it's interesting because so much of what we're providing is it is content is information and if you i guess you can look at it's it's interesting because if you look at i i I, you know just to reference like the the gary v's of the world that you know Mm -hmm. content is king and you have to be consistently pushing out content um Mm -hmm. and you're saying that it's not really content but rather it's a it's a um projection of faith that change is possible um, and transformation is possible. That's what you're trying to get across much more than, than content. So I guess what, what does come out when, when a person like that would speak? Because I think the difference, the difference in, in a lot of ways is that when a person spends money on a conference, I think there's already a certain level of buy-in either subconsciously or consciously that they're mm-hmm. either looking for information or practically speaking, they want to change, right? Whereas when you're prospecting and, or, you know, you have a, like, you just, you know, like you have your, your, your shop up and you're like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rabbi or I'm a, I'm a coach or whatever it might be. People might not have enrolled per se, but it's, it's, there's not yet that enrollment. So the question is what's the first step to get the enrollment? Okay. So it's, I'm really, I'm, we'll have a, we'll have a little, probably a little bit of back and forth just to make sure we cover all of our bases here. What I will say, though, in terms of the idea that content is king, what I offer for your consideration is that 
while content winds up being the vessel through which we ultimately influence our following and build our audience and whatnot. And I mean, I put out content too. This podcast is content. I mean, this is obviously a key part of everything. And so it's very clear that I am in full wholehearted support of the creation of content. What I will say, however, is the misguided assumptions people make about content is that just because they've put something out that it has value and content only has value in the, in the content. I mean, there, there's entertainment, there's all sorts of content, but in terms of persuasion, its value comes from people consuming it and then believing in a different possibility. Even if it's just this tiniest little thing that they're just reflecting on for a few minutes and they share it with other people and they want it, they're ultimately a bit more empowered in their life as a result of consuming the content. If you're putting out the content just for the sake of itself and it doesn't actually empower anyone, then ultimately it doesn't wind up serving you or your audience. And so it's just a matter of being deliberate and strategic as to how you create that content. And so this then circles us back to the first part of what you asked about. Let's talk about this rabbi who is looking to find ways to enroll people and to build the congregation and to move away from the fear, to do so in a way that isn't about you should go to synagogue, you should go to shul kind of thing. It's not, it's not that anymore. How does somebody who is more progressive and is looking to inspire and help people to create a new reality for themselves through the Jewish faith, how do they ultimately do it? And how do you, Jacob, wind up attracting people to a different way of doing that, right? And so you brought up a very key point, a key word, I should say, in presenting this question to me. And it's the question, the word enrollment. When you're thinking about someone you want to influence, not the only thing we need to do, but an absolute critical part of attracting them, of building them, like basically onboarding them into your vision, into your legacy. A key part of this is understanding and being able to express the problem they care about solving. We can have all of this content. This is the, the, the whole content is king thing. We have all this content, all of our solutions, all of our insights, all of our wisdom, all the things that we know to be true from our experience, from the experience of those with whom we've engaged, those whom we've helped. We have all of this content, all these ideas and, and tips and tricks and steps and hacks and all the things, right? But one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're looking to attract people to their movement is they completely bypass the problem that their target audience is already having and experiencing in their day-to-day -day life. Copywriters in the, in the marketing space already understand this, is that effective copywriting deals with what they call pain points. And that when you write an ad on Facebook or you write an ad in the newspaper or a magazine or whatever, you don't just start with, our stuff is the best and here are five steps and all of that. We talk about the pain. Like an example is if you are helping entrepreneurs and startup companies and stuff like that, and you're providing some sort of business strategy service, you could have an ad that says, these five steps will get you more business. Or you could say, are you struggling to find early adopters of your products? And that's what a startup is like. They can't get that tipping point. They can't get like that initial mass of early adopters who are going to get them to the tipping point and get them to be this ubiquitous brand. So in terms of your avatar, like the, the rabbis, you, Jacob, can speak around how much they're struggling to enroll people in a way that aligns with the way the world has, has evolved, the way that Judaism has taken shape, that what used to work these shoulds or your grandmother at the Holocaust or all that, that doesn't actually seem to attract people into the faith, into the community. And so your job would be to first speak to the problem they care about solving. It's like they wake up in the morning. What are they thinking about as they trudge to the bathroom to wash their face? And they're not thinking about like your Jacob, your ideas and insights. They're thinking about, wow, my congregation is down 30% from five years ago 
and I feel like it's going to be down by 70% within another five years and what have you. What am I going to do about this? You know, it's interesting because this is something that I, as a coach, uh, speak, uh, and I think it's, I think there's, it's it, it, a lot of times we have challenges and difficulties around our target demographic. So as we're saying this, I'm thinking like, yeah, that that is definitely something people worried about. On the flip side, I see it as an opportunity because if other people have lost their ability to communicate effectively uh, and and to and to grow numbers, so I think okay, well that's where I can really step in because at the end of the day, it's like I don't, I, me personally, I don't think there's a value to keeping around institutions just for the sake of keeping them around, and right. I'd be happier that they shut their doors versus and got out of the way that which I think I just I think I was just. Uh, echoing what Obama said recently today. He said something about how old men need to get out of the way in order to, which is interesting because from a Jewish perspective, yeah. it, it, that's not necessarily true because we do value the role of, of the rabbis and the sages. But that being said, um, we, we, we definitely need someone who's able to effectively translate the wisdom into modern day communication. And so I, I think the way I'm shifting it is I'm thinking to myself, okay, so let's let me lead by example so that other people can watch sort of what I'm doing that works. Mm -hmm. But my target demographic is there's a world out there that from a Jewish perspective might not be connected with their truest essence and are not living their highest life. People have, like you said, the imposter syndrome. People have a sense that they aren't entitled to, they're not, they're not a good, they're not a good enough person that, that, that God doesn't care about them. They don't even know yeah. if, if like, what, what does that mean? There's so much negative, nonsense around again it's like so fundamental that that people are living disconnected and mm. in pain and lonely and i would venture to say that spirituality in general and judaism in specific is there as an anecdote or as a prescription to feeling that darkness and if people appreciated oh. that if people appreciated that, then there would be no problem on the other end of getting people to show up and enroll because people are naturally inclined to wanting to live a more, I don't want to say meaningful because I think that, that you could find meaning anywhere, but I think a, a, a more nourishing know, life. What's that? Maybe a more nourishing life. A more nourishing life is a great, is a great way of putting it. Yes. I mean, I, I was working with a client and I, I live in LA and I was working with a client who lives in Orange County, California, and she rediscovered her Judaism relatively recently. She was raised Jewish and then through certain traumatic, traumatic events, stepped, like, stepped out of that whole world and then rediscovered it and has begun the process of integration from, from what she once experienced through her, her Judaism. And I helped her with a guest sermon that she put together for a Friday night service. Okay. And so I went down to Orange County and I went to listen to it. And what I said to her afterwards, it was, it was headed, it, it was a reformed liberal congregation and whatnot. But what I said to her is like, if Judaism was like that growing up, then I wouldn't feel nearly as disenfranchised right now. Like, I, I mean, it was just, nourishing uplifting i just felt good in the experience of the service it was a sense i mean i didn't know these people but i i sensed a warmth and a kindness pervasive throughout the room and that's exactly what it, it was a nourishing experience and so the work for the for your audience like we've talked about you being more persuasive with these rabbis now how do the rabbis themselves become more persuasive is that they think about life in the context of the would be congregation, the people who they're looking to attract and the pain that they're in and there's a way out and the experience, like it's once like the, the act is getting them in the door. So if you got, if these rabbis got, someone in the door and that person had an experience approximate to what I had down in Orange County, there's a pretty good chance they would come back again. Cause it's like, I didn't know Judaism could be this kind of thing. So that's so, okay. So I, I'm so excited about this. If, if yeah. possible, if we could rewind it. So two things, first of all, what one, one approach is that, I, and I, again, I don't know your client, 
Um, but it, trauma could certainly leave, lead a person away from, from, from that. And obviously it's like, yeah. you could have the most, you know, spiritually elevated life in the world. But if let's just say in the case of like some kind of, you know, God forbid molestation or, or something right. like that, it's like, thank you very much. I'm leaving. If the practitioner of your spirituality shows themselves to be abusive Oh, or, right. Well, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. But let's yeah. say also there's a, there's a book right now that's a bestseller um, by Sarah Horowitz, who it was Michelle Obama's speechwriter. And mm -hmm. she wrote a book about how she was massively disenfranchised from Judaism because she thought there's nothing there. And then in her mid thirties, she started re, re, rediscovering it. And lo and behold, you have a bestseller on your hands this novice w woman that basically went back, not, not that she's a woman in any way makes her a novice and not that the, I, I, that, that came out totally wrong. But what I'm saying is you have a novice um, person who is um, rediscovering it and wrote a book that, uh, that, that, that has captured not just a Jewish audience, but a non-Jewish audience as well. So I look at that and I'm saying, there's a tremendous market for this specific Jewish spiritual meaning, if you could have someone that's not even a professional at it, just discovering it and writing it. And what was so beautiful in a lot of ways of, what was so beautiful about, in a lot of ways about, about her book was that she did bring in all of the same, I guess you can say expectation and enthusiasm that had motivated her to write for Michelle Obama and mm -hmm. is now saying this kind of a person, if this person could find meaning in traditional Judaism, it's like, yeah. come on, like there's such a market here. So yeah. here's something like that. I go crazy. So like, what am I supposed to do with that? Really, it comes down to being sensitive to any given person's journey and the experience of your message, your solution, whatever movement you're putting out into the world. And so if you, I, okay, so I have, um, I have, uh, I have an example here in very much relevant to what we're talking about. Only a month ago, I sadly just lost my father. Oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear that. And thank you. And the way it ultimately went down was that we, this, this was in upstate New York and I happened to already be in New York at the time when this all went down. So I was there to be part of the process and was in the room when he passed and all of that. And basically, the, the family wanted a Jewish service. And I, I didn't particularly want that myself. But so, and can then- I, Can I slow you down on that and just ask like, to, and tell me if, if I'm definitely overstepping my boundaries. Oh, no, no. What about, because I'm looking at you as the same way that I look at Sarah Hurwitz and I'm like, here's a- Take, take, you know, don't, don't think this is the wrong way. Here's a beautiful Jewish man who, who is unbelievably cultured, well-educated, completely, you know, at, 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 like in the world that understands the world. And there was some kind of a break where your, your sense expressed itself in a way that, that might be, I don't want to say alienated from Judaism, but doesn't, doesn't plug in and doesn't say like, obviously this is how I want to express myself. So it would be right. helpful for you to, to, just to help me expand my mind a little bit in terms of why I guess I'm just projecting like, well, if Judaism didn't mean that much while we were growing up, why suddenly when somebody, when somebody passes away, do we kind of harken back to this antiquated system? Is that where it comes from or t tell me more? Yeah. I mean, I don't like my, my dad didn't, my dad would have just been fine being cream. What, what I know about my dad is that he would have been, pretty appalled knowing that I had to shell out this money for this expensive service. And even the, the plain pine box that he was buried in was more elaborate than what I remember other people being buried in. I was like, this, this doesn't feel right. This is not plain. Uh, and this is definitely yeah, very expensive. Like really? I mean, it had a star of David on it. It was like, it was not ornate, but it was certainly decorated. I was like, this is not what even the tradition says is supposed to happen. Um, but yeah, and that was the that's my beef as well. Is like he wasn't living this way, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we become Jewish again, kind of thing. I mean, admittedly, he would have Pesach service, like dinner and and all of that. I mean, there were some aspects of his upbringing and heritage in his life around the holidays and whatnot, but not not even like he didn't even go to synagogue on the high holy days and stuff like that, and so. 
the issue I ultimately, the reason I brought it up, Jacob, is that we didn't have a relationship with a local rabbi. We, we just needed to bring somebody on board who had a very tenuous connection to, to the family. I mean, this is like my dad and my dad's partner and it was, he was living where my dad's partner grew up. And so her, her connections were really what led to who we would go through, go to with a rabbi or which rabbi and whatnot. She knew who she didn't want. And so we wound up with this very well-meaning young man. He's probably, how it goes. It's like, we don't want that guy. So yeah, yeah exactly. So th- this was a, a very well-meaning young man. He was in his late twenties. And while at the cemetery, while people were, digging and whatnot, he asked me if I'm connected to to the Chabad in LA. And he went from a very, it it was the way the converse, this whole thing, Jacob, is me bringing all this up is really about that moment and that conversation to make a larger point that I'd like to make that is meant to be hopefully useful to you and your listeners is that he didn't investigate. He didn't enter the conversation from a place of curiosity he just started talking about his solutions. As in the way, if you're in torment around the loss of your father, then join this this Orthodox Hasidic type community in your area kind of thing. And, And that was his only way of relating to the whole thing. And it's just like, what you need is a lot of really intense Judaism right now. I mean, that's how I experience it. I can't, I don't presume to know exactly what he was thinking, but that was what was implied by the question. And I just fumbled my way. I mean, I was in the, literally in the process of burying my father in that moment when, when he asked me the question, it was the dirt was going into, into the grave right at that moment. And what I would have wanted, what I wanted if for me to even be open to anything new beyond the grieving process I already intended to have once I returned home and I'm currently going through right now is some sense of what was Judaism like for you growing up? Or how do you feel about Judaism now? Or what, how would you even generally, like how would you describe your spirituality, your sense of faith, in the unseen and started from a place of where I was at, which is in a highly secular existentialist reality. I'm very much about self-determination. And so he didn't know any of that. He was just ready to go in for, for his stuff. He wanted the content to be given to me. The Chabad was his content, right? And so what I want for your for the the rabbis among you to to go about is to be curiosity about the problems that their people or would be people face curiosity about what their reality is. And then to very gradually get to know their reality before offering this other one, this other possibility, because a different possibility is a different reality. That's what it is. But if we're entrenched in our pain, then that reality won't ever shift, at least in the way they want, because they haven't taken the time to be empathetic to our experience first. You know what's such a, what's, thank you, first of all, thank you very much for sharing that. And I'm sorry that, that the, that there was a breakdown in communication in terms of what he must have thought he was offering versus what you heard him offering and the time at which he was offering it, which must have come across as completely inappropriate. <laughs> um, the, the, the question that I grapple with, and it's, it's, it's an interesting problem that I experienced because I grew up, you grew up conservative, I grew up reform, and in the pro, I, I just <clears throat> I remember having two moments that were uh, very, I, I don't, you know, that you have sometimes these things that kind of come upon you and you don't really know sort of w- where or why. And then you sort of like appreciate the, the, the profundity of the, of the insight down the road. Yeah. Um, but one, one insight I had was uh, my, my now wife back then girlfriend had dragged me to 
the Hancock Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which is the, you know, kind of ultra orthodox uh, yeah. area. And we went to the Kolel of Los Angeles, which is kind of the, it's not a Lubavitch uh, institution, but it's pretty much like a, you know, r rabbinic, uh, how do you even, well, you even say what a Kolel is? It's like a, it's like a rabbinic college of, of, of full-time rabbis whose job is to study for hour, you know, for hours a day and have been doing this at a, very high level for many, many years. So it's about the most orthodox place you could be in LA. And I remember, yeah. um, and, and I stuck out like a sore throat. I asked, you know, I was like, what should I wear? And my, my, my wife said, just, you know, pick whatever makes you comfortable. So I was wearing like a blue, this is in the 90s. So I was wearing like a, like, like light, very light colored pants and a blue button down. And everyone is in, you know, white and black with a hat. Yeah, and hat. I remember yeah. in, during the, their, their silent prayer time, uh, saying to my relationship that i had with god hey god even though we're in kind of a different environment um we can, we're still we're still cool and it was very fascinating because i think what what i'm one of the things that resonated with me when you sh shared your story is that for so many of and again i can't i, I think this is for everybody i i can only say specifically just because i've had this conversation more with jews is i feel like most or all jews more mo a lot of jews that i talk to have a spiritual experience so to speak have a, have some kind of a, of a of a relationship with the esoteric mm -hmm. and it feels highly individual like a like a relationship does a boyfriend girlfriend marriage whatever it might be and it's very hard when someone tries to come to talk about your identity and seems to portray it as knowing more about it than you do right which is highly right. problematic because it's like, I've been Jewish my whole life. I don't need you, Mr. Man with the hat on to tell me about, you know what I'm And the same thing was true with like with marriage, like we were learning and retroactively, I realized like how unfortunate that was is that, you know, I had been with my, with my then girlfriend, now wife for four years and we were learning like marriage classes. And I'm like, dude, this isn't just some random woman I'm marrying who I've never known before. Like this is my, friend and girlfriend of four years. So don't yeah. try to tell me this is how a, a man and a woman are. And so it's, that's a huge hump for me to get over um, when, because ultimately it's like, you are the kind of person that I'd like to talk to. Or I think about a, again, a, a, a Jew that's living in the world. And, yeah. and, and then it's like, so then how do you overcome that? Is it, or maybe that is how you overcome it is you realize that everyone's got, and this is, again, I'm, I'm, I'm spewing a little bit, but, but my big challenge is we are so individual about, it's like giving marriage advice. Like you can give the best marriage advice, but if a person doesn't feel like you're in their home watching their, them talk to their spouse, right? It's like, you can't tell me what to do because you don't know. You, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. it's, it's, that's, that's, a, that's a painfully difficult um, bridge to get over. And that's sort of why also I look at technology as the great equalizer because it's like yes you could go to the chabad house in la of which there's 10 million and you know and whatever and that that's fine chances yeah. are you probably won't because yeah. you don't want to take that step of subjecting yourself to a foreign environment it's like who I, i'm just saying like nowadays like who would go and just randomly apply for a course if you couldn't check it out online? Like everything nowadays right. is, you know, like I'm not gonna go to a restaurant unless I've Googled it. I Google bars, right. I Google everything. And it's like, yeah. I'm not gonna go in like something as important as my Judaism unless I know what I'm getting myself into by having tasted the content, so to speak. Like, why would I go into that? Right, right, absolutely. And it's, and you use a key word in all of this, Jacob, is that foreign, like, like, like the idea that something feels foreign. What we're looking to do to be more persuasive, but persuasive from a place of heart, right? And I want to always emphasize that we're not talking about manipulating people. We're talking about persuading them of something out of their own, like, so as to live that more nourished, more fulfilling life, right? That's the whole intention here. What these kind of people who are just top down telling you what to do. Someone's telling you after being with your girlfriend for four years, what it's supposed to be like or something like that. The reason why you rebelled as I'm hearing it is that you just didn't feel seen. Yeah, or heard, right. Or heard. And we cannot ever over underestimate over. I don't know. Cannot <laughs> we cannot over -estimate minimize the significance. Right, right, right. We cannot minimize the importance and significance 
of how any given moment of our life as human beings, we simply desire feeling seen and heard. Can you, and that, now here's like the crux of what I'm like struggling with so much is can yeah. you scale that? Or by definition, you can't scale that. And it's all built, because I'm like, you know, again, not to, not to spill all of, the, all of the beans of the, of the big, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. It's like, how do, how do you create, you know, it's, wow, listen to this one. This is awesome. The language that, there, so there's, there, back, in the, back in the old days when we lived in, in Israel and we yeah. had a temple, so the, 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 the three, times a day, three times a year, the Jews were supposed to go to Jerusalem, to the temple on Passover and on Shavuot and on Sukkot. And, and literally the language that was used was they were supposed to be seen by God. And so it's such an interesting concept that what mm. you're saying, and, and I resonate so deeply with also, maybe I was saying and you were resonating with, I'm not sure, but Whatever. how do you, you know, it's like there is that concept that you could be a farmer living in the north of Israel, but you need to be seen by God in order to have that, not that God needs to see you because God can see you anywhere, but, but you have to yeah. feel like you're being seen. Right. Exactly. And, and how do you create that experience for people nowadays? I mean, you do have technology, but it's still like, that, like what you're saying is, it, 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 it's, it's like, it's killing me. It keeps me up at night. It's like, hmm. I'm not trying to tell you stuff because like, you're okay. And how do I know what you need anyway? And, and if, you know, if, if anything, it's like, maybe if they're, I'm saying like, Maybe I know something. I've studied Judaism at a fairly high level for over a decade. And mm -hmm. maybe there's something in Neil's life, that, that, in, in Jewish life, that could enhance Neil's life. Maybe. I don't know. Because sure. I, I, I need to know you. I need to right. know what you're looking for. You know, it's like, yeah, like the death of a parent is, it opens you up because you're like a different person now. Because now you're someone that doesn't have your dad. And right. you don't know what your life is now that you don't have your dad because you're in a new world of identity. And maybe there's something there for you. But I don't know because I don't know, like, ah, how do you cross that chasm? Or mm -hmm. what would you want to hear where you would say, yes, I'd be interested in potentially looking at more of that? It's a really good question. And... I have, we have a couple of ways we could look at it. One way that is, is putting it in a very specific, tangible marketing context, which is, please, I, I would ask for yours and your listeners' forgiveness for seemingly trivializing what we're about. All to I do is I take everything I turn into business. I'm like, here's yeah, the marriage yeah. and here's the, here's the death yeah. of something. And let's talk about how that works in a business setting. So let's say through the wizard like algorithmic genius that is Facebook ads targeting. You can just type in mm. former Jews who've lost their parents as a general interest in Facebook. Like I, my life changed when I suddenly started tar targeting people who are just interested in public speaking in Facebook and it changed my entire life, right? Yeah. That, it was simple, simple as that. Yeah, it, it was the targeting, the targeting gods very smile, very much smiled upon me that day. But let's say you could do that. And there were half a million, 30 or 40 something disenfranchised Jews in America who have all lost their parents in the last year. Right. Let's just say, I mean, that's probably an exaggeratedly high number, but let's just say it for, for argument's sake. You could then target those people. And instead of talking about how great Judaism is and have you found the Chabad community in, your, in, in LA or whatever it is, right? Instead of that, you might write something along the lines of, if you've recently lost a parent, you may be struggling with how to make sense of this roller coaster of emotions that one day you feel okay and another day you feel super low. And then the next day, weirdly and miraculously, you feel great and you're going back and forth and you're trying to talk to people about it and they're well-meaning and they don't really understand what you're going through because they've never lost a parent and they say trite things or they say banal things or they say things that you really in another day would really like, but you're just too triggered right now and you can't listen to them kind of thing. 
and you go to bed at night feeling alone and forgotten because eventually you know that all of a sudden this attention you have for being in a state of loss is going to go away because people get back to their lives. And but what do you honestly... Yeah, and, and your parents are not coming back though. So and you're your gonna parents are not coming you're back, right? so you can't talk to them about it. They right. were your unconditional support system, and now you don't even have that anymore. At no point have I talked about Judaism in that entire thing. I have talked about the experience of the person who's being targeted as a, as a disenfranchised Jewish American, but at no point is that the thing. This is getting really granular to like the, no, that's what I'm, that, that's, the, the copywriting and all of that. And how much do you talk about in a Facebook ad in this context? But what I've done in going through all of that, Jacob, is, is I've shown a potentially scalable way to get inside the hearts and minds of the people I most want to reach because it's just running an ad with half a million impressions over the course over, across all of Facebook in the United States of the 260 million people on Facebook or whatever the number is currently in the United States, I found the half a million who are struggling with that particular thing. And then I might say, check out this video. Maybe it's a 15 minute video and talking about, and you reinforce that stuff and it's got to be done with deafness and all of that, but eventually you bring up the idea that a way out of all of this is with not just is with the Jewish community and you be very quick. And again, this, this, I'm just spitballing. So I don't know how this would be, how I would recommend it. It's, no, it's, it's so, what you're saying is so profound. And it's like, at the end of the day, this idea that marketers can save the world. It's like, if you look at, Jay Shetty stuff or Prince yeah. E. How do you say, is it Prince E. A. or Prince E. I don't know how you say it, but whatever. I'm not it is. your guy there. <laughs> what, whatever, whatever. The way that they promote it, it's like if you've ever been broken up with, watch this, and it's the same thing. It's like, it's like the 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 Sarah Hurwitz of the world. It's like if you're a 35 year old woman or a 35 year old man who's just been broken up with. And you're like, you thought you were going to have like a Jewish family and now you have no prospects. You have no idea where the hell you're going, you know? So yeah. it's like, that's, and it's like, and, and again, for me, it's not like therefore join your local, you know, your local synagogue. For me, it's like Judaism has something to offer there. And it's not necessarily joining a synagogue. You might want to, if that helps you down the road, yeah. I, I'm not sure. You know, I think that one of the big, um, Lies. Right, this sounds so bad, and maybe I'll be editing this later. But I'll, I'll just keep it in mind. So you know, was paying attention. You know, one of the big lies that lines the pockets of people is it's like your solution is joining a high-priced, you know, synagogue. You know, like may, maybe that's not the truth. Maybe it's like no, but but you know, it's again, it's a brilliant idea. It says that, it says that when a person loses a parent in Judaism, they're they're an orphan no matter how old they are. And so yeah. if you if you now you're like wow. So it's like, God understands me in a certain way. Judaism understands me because I do feel like an orphan, but it's like, but dude, you're like, you know, an orphan is like seven year old, you know, what's it called? The uh, hard knock life character built up. I'm see, I've just, I've just lost hopefully yeah. all respect with uh, with you as a classic student of uh, literature, but hopefully won some credibility for people that like uh, Jay-Z, but- um, Not as classic as you might think, Jacob, but please go on. <laughs> okay, but you, you know what I'm talking about. But, ba but basically it's like, you know, like on one hand, you're like, what's wrong with me? I'm a grown man and I can't stop crying. On the other hand, you're like, well, you know, that, that, that's still relevant to me because I do feel like an orphan, even though I'm not seven years old anymore, or whatever it was, because I did lose this important person in my life. I, I don't know. It's, it's a, huh, it, you know, it's funny at, at the end of the day, what, what I want to walk out of, I know, I know I want to be respectful of your time and, and I'm probably going to beg you at the end of this to, uh, to come back and to do a little bit more or potentially even not on, uh, not on the call that we would, <laughs> and I can, I can pick your brain for more targeted marketing opportunities, but the 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 point is I, I i had an experience where i was sitting down with someone who was one of the early he, whatever he exited early from linkedin and so he has lots of money and, mm -hmm. and and one of the things that he was lamenting was that you know people are so plugged into their phones nowadays that you can never really hope to make an impact anymore because everyone's just too damn distracted mm -hmm. and i saw things so different because i see what you just described, because since everyone's so attracted to their phones, you might never walk into the Chabad of Los Angeles, but you're sure as hell going to pick up your smartphone and probably go on Instagram later today. 
or whatever right. your social platform is. Right. So right. if we as a, as a Jewish community can realize, I guess, putting together, figuring out how to articulate the content from a like reverse, reverse uh, in, engineering it, right? Mm-hmm. And there is, yeah. I think, a great deal of potential for, for future engagement. Not sure. Yeah, yet, but absolutely. I mean, look, we talked about. <laughs> there are so many opportunities to to do that, but it is ultimate to like how how to ultimately use the specific tools in front of us and whatnot. Like, I got very granular with Facebook targeting and all of that, but more even in an analog sense, there's the potential, whether it's digital or analog, there's the potential to investigate, to be curious around the people you are intending to help the most to find out what their experience is, especially if they're a disenfranchised Jew, you can find out what was it that ultimately led to that. And first of all, the people who you ask that question to will be that much more interested because suddenly they are feeling seen and heard because someone's curious about their life. And so curiosity is a tremendous panacea for for beginning the healing process in so many different contexts in the way we experience the world today. That being, I I truly feel Jacob that curiosity is the currency of a thriving 21st century if we get there. And, and, and I will just add that that's why it's so difficult for practitioners of religion because I, I had a rabbi one time in my early, my rabbinic career who told me, and he says that all rabbis have a messianic complex because they think they're going to, you know, change the world. And so it's again, it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're an expert, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you're, you're an expert. You help people communicate. I, I'm an expert. I try to help people li- live more fulfilled lives and show up better for work. Mm-hmm. And so we're experts, right? But there's yeah. an ego that goes into that because it's like, I'm going to take you, Mr. Successful man and help you be more successful or you, Mr. Miss successful woman and make you more successful. But then yeah. it's like you add the God power on top of it. And by the way, the Lord compels me to do this. It, there's so much there's so much room for ego inflation and c- curiosity is the opposite of ego inflation because it's putting the emphasis on the person in front of you and yeah. opening yourself up to that very real uh, risk that they'll say something that you won't know how to respond to and then you're going to look like a big idiot you know what i'm saying but it's like yeah. that's that humility game that comes into it which i think is also why it's very hard i'm not knocking anybody but i'm just saying sure. it's 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 more difficult because humility and, and clergy, I don't know, again, from a biblical sense, yes, it went together. Practically speaking, the world we live in today, it's, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of interesting, Jacob, because I'm, I'm coming at this from a lay person, so I absolutely need to qualify what I'm about to say. But even in just working on various book projects and other working with other experts over the years, one of the things that I've picked up on is that the very origin stories of these seemingly disparate religions seem to come back to the same fundamental thing that when we think about Moses up on the mountain and we think about Jesus out in the desert and we think about Buddha under the Bodhi tree and all of these other, and and Muhammad, like all all of these, these prophets or whatever we call them according to whatever whatever framework we're using, fundamentally, it seems to be about stripping away the suffering that comes up in the, our earthly existence and finding some sense of divinity, a divine connection to all that is. And that's, that's something we could argue and debate and whatnot, but that's at least my interpretation of the lore around these various people who are the figureheads of the different religions. And it seems like we've ultimately gone in this disparate direction and these different denominations of Christianity and these different interpretations of Judaism. And of course the radicalization of certain fundamentalist groups and all of that. Right. And so it just, everyone gets very nervous. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's just like there, there's, there's like all of these very disparate things and it's led to a tremendous amount of, of antagonizing forces playing out against each other and over, over centuries. I don't mean just recently, I mean, over centuries. And what's interesting is that, the digital revolution has connected everyone. And so there's actually potential if somebody is persuasive and heart centered in not just this, this should thumping, like you have to do this kind of thing, your grandmother, exactly what you're describing at the beginning of our call. 
it would um it's possible to actually unify again and actually if people get curious about the plight of the modern person and then connect the dots between the more essential truth that started all those thousands of years ago with their reality now that ironically could actually wind up becoming a rather unifying experience using the traditions of Judaism in one way and then in like your counterparts in other religions who are looking to help people in the exact same way would use the wisdom of their path, but it all gets us back to the same place of this ultimately nourished and fulfilled life. I get so excited. I'm so like overwhelmed right now. I'm like, Oh my God, now what? Uh, <laughs> well, so, you can start with a $10 buy, ad buy in Facebook. So. That's, I guess so. I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, okay. So Neil, I, I appreciate this so much. Unfortunately, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Tell of uh, people how, how um, our listeners can be in touch with you. And then I'm hopefully going to solicit you to come, uh, to come back again and, and do some more, uh, some more discussing. Of course. Well, I'd be happy to do that, Jacob. And so you can find me at neilcanhelp.com, N-E-I-L-C-A-N-H-E-L-P.com. And you'll see the stuff around speaking. And I'm not sure when this is dropping in coordination with my next thing. I'm very excited in, this, in the conversation around curiosity and whatnot. I'll be launching a speaker quiz soon where people can learn what type of speaker they can be to be the most captivating and enthralling of a speaker possible. And so that's another thought for you and for your listeners. I'm I'm waiting until you're ready to drop it. So tell people where they can find that. Or is that just going to be through the website? You'll be able to find it. I'll I'll definitely connect it through the website. So neilcanhelp.com will be the home base on all of that. And you can find the speaker quiz and, and check that out. Outstanding. Neil, thank you so much for the time. All right. Thank you very much, Jacob. I really love this conversation. There you have it, folks. Another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, We have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.